we're going to have a panel discussion around crowdfunding. Uh, many of you in the room would simply define crowdfunding as Kickstarter or Indiegogo or another platform along those lines. Um, this space is rapidly expanding, and we think it's significant for retailers, particularly in the room, to know about what's happening in the US, where you see Best Buy, you see Brookstone, and you see other retail players stepping squarely into this space with their own crowdfunding style platforms. Uh, so I'm going to bring four gentlemen to the stage to share with you their insight and experience and ask questions of one another. I will ask you to hold your applause until they all come on the stage. I'll do it uh, in, in sort of a, a quick order. Uh, from Rue Baguette to Lamar Williams, if you'll step up and join us on stage. Lamar is our moderator. Uh, many of you know Rue, Rue Baguette is a company that sits squarely in that space between industry and internet. So thank you, Lamar, for sharing uh, your insight with us, but also asking some questions of our uh, three panelists who will be joining you. Carlo Ferraris from InCharge. Uh, some of you have seen him on stage or seen him in the uh, discovery area. Thank you. Uh, Christian Smith from Tracker. If you'll join us up here as part of the panel. And Ori Fruhoff from Upright. If you would fill out the panel on stage. Uh, these three startups have all successfully gone through various rounds of crowdfunding in their own right. Welcome to you. Thanks. So before I turn it over to you, Lamar, I want to do a, a special thanks uh, for joining us on the big stage to share with us uh, your experiences, to share what you think the retail and distribution audience needs to know about crowdfunding and how it's going to change the nature of their relationships with the products and the vendors that they're working with. So once again, thank you, and a round of applause for all these gentlemen, if you would, please. And Lamar, I turn it over to you. Thanks. Thank you, Ryan. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started with a brief introduction of our three panelists. Uh, we'll start with Carlo. Hi, uh, I'm Carlo. I'm uh, one of the two people behind uh, In Charge. Uh, in Charge is the smallest uh, curing cable in the world. Um, we funded our first campaign with uh, Indiegogo, which was uh, the biggest campaign uh, ever in Switzerland, and uh, raised 1,400% uh, uh, of our uh, of the goal we're, we were asking for. Thank you. Um, I'm Christian Smith. I'm one of the co-founders of Tracker. Um, we've run uh, multiple crowdfunding campaigns on Indiegogo. We've, we've run four campaigns. Um, the, the most lucrative raised 1.7 million. Um, and yeah, it's just been a really exciting way to see products uh, come to life, you know, you, to show an idea and then um, actually bring it out to, to people and, and have it help them. Um, my name is Ori. I'm one of the co-founders of Upright. It's a device that trains you to improve your posture. Uh, we did our crowdfunding campaign on Indiegogo almost uh, two years ago and raised um, about 220% of our uh, first initial goal. And about three months ago, we finally delivered the product to our about uh, 3,000 uh, pre-orders. So you, all three have had some pretty fantastic fundraisings. And so I, what I want to know is, why did you choose Indiegogo? Because it sounds like everyone across the board chose Indiegogo. Uh, so give us uh, some the why. Yeah, there are a few um, really great crowdfunding platforms out there. Um, I think the reason why we've chosen to work with Indiegogo is because um, they've always been a huge advocate in the hardware space. Um, they provide um, some of their team members to go through and vet your campaign. Um, they basically tear it apart. They tell you, you know, hey, I think this looks good, but you know, many of our users are not going to understand this. And they provide so much data and analytics, um, both on kind of, you know, from the experience side, um, from seeing previous campaigns, mm -hmm. to also, um, you know, while your campaign's live, they give you much more data than most other platforms. Um, and the, um, they have something called the go-go factor. So if you ha um, are hit certain metrics of growth for your campaign, um, then you're very likely to be featured on their, the front page of their website, um, and then also on their email. So. Um, those types of uh, helpful things will really accelerate the growth of the, your crowdfunding platform from 
your audience to um, you know growing with some of their organic right. um, traffic. And as you had the opportunity to choose Kickstarter or GoFundMe, why, why did you choose uh, Indiegogo? For um, it was uh, the back-end analytics um, okay. and the referral campaigns. Um, and then um, Indiegogo allows you to simulate a retail environment by selling multiple packages. So, um, you know, with our Tracker Bravo device, um, okay. because we people saw that it was important that, you know, they would buy more than one. Um, and we wanted to find out what pricing worked very well okay. um, of those packages so that we could take, you know, a one and, you know, two pack and a 10 pack to retail. Um, so we were able to find out all okay. of that pricing. I want to get um, Ori and Carlo in on this because I know you're coming from the US. There's many options, but why from your and Ori did you choose it, um, especially since you're not, uh, you weren't currently in the US market? Definitely. Um, I think so I, I, this is exa the exact point. I really like the internationality of Indiegogo versus some of the other platforms. Uh, us being in Israel um, or from Europe, we have some restrictions working with other platforms, and I think the, the environment of Indiegogo as opposed to other plat um, crowdfunding um, platforms uh, regarding the internationality and, and uh, um, even the team members that work on that platform you know, are, are from all over the world, so really like that, and this is one of the um, main reasons we chose to work with them as well. Actually, today they already have um, a presence in Israel, and I'm sure in some other countries in Europe as well. So then you have also an uh, on-the-ground contact you can work with, speaks your language, you can meet with them in your office. So it's very, very nice um, okay. and helps the, the campaign as well. That's really interesting and important. Definitely. I'm assuming. Definitely. It's, it's okay. And Carlo? Uh, whenever we started our first campaign, uh, Indiegogo was, uh, we were, we were uh, debating between Kickstarter and Indiegogo. But unfortunately, Kickstarter wasn't available in uh, Switzerland yet. Mm -hmm. uh, it just came available uh, a few months ago, I think. So uh, we decided to go with uh, Indiegogo, and we found out it was a very good choice because uh, they have, uh, as Christian was saying, uh, this go go factor, which uh, if your campaign, if, if you know, backers like your campaign, it follows a, a curve, then they put it on uh, the, fr the front page and they send it in the newsletter and everything. We also had uh, a good, uh, you know, uh, support from the Indiegogo team. Not what uh, what uh, Christian said about, uh, you know, uh, support with the with the actual development of the product. I mm -hmm. think that was maybe in the early stage of Indiegogo. I think now they have too many campaigns to manage. I yeah, you just have to email people and. Oh, plug okay. Them. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't try. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, about uh, everything else, they were very supportive. So yeah, we. Okay. Moving to the more customer side of things and the validation of customers, how uh, did that process work for you? And did you do surveys on um, the consumers that you were reaching? What what type of process of validation for you did that did happen in that, Carlo? Yeah, we throughout the campaign we did uh, some uh, surveys to see what uh, what they wanted, what bakers wanted more. We are, uh, it's common to do stretch goals mm -hmm. in, uh, mm -hmm. in campaigns so to see if we reach uh, this new goal, once you have uh, already you know, reached uh, your, your goal, you, you do a stretch goal to get uh, you know, a new future for, for the product. So we offer a new color, a new shape, uh, yeah. Did you do any customizations for, uh, specific customizations for the clients? Um, now or uh, we we are stuck with the with the options we offered with our campaigns. Okay. Yeah, because uh, that's what they asked for in the. But beginning. as far as in personalization, that isn't something that. You're no. Doing. Okay. okay. Hey. Christian. Yeah, um, we saw that uh, customization, and you know, when we started our our Tracker Bravo campaign, we only offered a silver device, and one of the reasons why we were able to go from, um, you know. Have, uh, I think when we only had the silver device, we were at about $50,000. Um, what took us to over a million was going back to all of those customers and really getting their feedback and input on what they wanted to see the product become. Um, 
So we were able to um, ask them about um, you know, accessories, um, colors, and uh, laser engraving. Mm -hmm. And so those three kind of um, different customizations were um, ways that we got backers engaged um, and we saw many people who purchased, you know, a one or two pack would upgrade to the 10 pack um, because, you know, we asked, we surveyed our backers and found out what the most important colors were to them. Mm -hmm. And then we gave them a way to, you know, by sharing the campaign, they could get a free color upgrade. From and a product validation standpoint, that's super, it's great. Um, to have that knowledge from the consumers, what they what they're actually looking for, and how you can redevelop the product. Ori, did yeah, you? It, that's that's the exact point. I mean, having a community of people who actually want your product, and then you can ask them, um, do you prefer this type or this color? So that's something huge that you, you you only get on crowdfunding, right? And what we actually did, we took it a step further, and we didn't have our charger designed yet ah. uh, to our product. So and we had about um, um, 1,500 um, already backers, and we asked them. We gave them four designs from our designer, like drawings. Which one do you prefer? We did a quick survey. They chose one, and this is actually the one that we went on and manufactured in our manufacturing in China. And then obviously they, they they feel part of the product, part of the company, part of the startup, and it's a great great way to get everything going, and it was really, really success, successful for us. Okay. Did you guys see that the pe those people are more likely to share? Well, the guys that, that um, once you interact with them, we definitely see that those are the ones that were, were like spreading the word of our campaign, of, of, of even of them being part mm -hmm. of, of the company, which mm -hmm. is, I think, the great thing that, that we have on crowdfunding. And I heard that some of you did multiple campaigns. Um, why? Uh, why would you need to do that? Why wouldn't you just go directly to a distributor after it seems like you were already validated for your product? Uh, we did a, a second campaign after receiving the feedback of our first, uh, you know, 30,000 backers from our first campaign. And uh, we, um, we addressed all the issues uh, they, they pointed out, uh, uh, launched this new version, which solved all, all those issues. And also uh, was a, a different um, serve a little bit of a different purpose because some people wanted to to have a, you know a quicker charge and don't, don't have a charge and data transfer mm -hmm. and we offer just the charge uh, but quicker you know so we wanted to make uh, all of our bakers happy you know okay so you re you wanted to revalidate the product yes yes and so now are you going towards distribution or? yes okay. now we are we are here at this tray you know to find the the, the best distributors for okay. a product okay Christian yeah I think that um, you know uh, using kind of this um, lean startup model it, it Eric Reese introduced this concept of a minimum viable product mm -hmm. um, or an MVP and when you want, what you want to do, I think, with crowdfunding is find out what the MVP is and validate that. And then you can, you know, use those backers and users um, to, when they get the product, to, um, you know, incrementally innovate um, so that you're, f um, you're constantly funding all of your development cycles. Um, so we've seen that at Tracker, you know, um, con continuously listening to um, the voices of our users um, and making changes that um, that actually that, that our users care deeply about is the right way to drive innovation, um, and it drives the speed of um, and the direction um, that we innovate. And so that's I think you know. Running multiple campaigns has allowed us to, um, you know, accelerate the growth of our company. And I would say cost as well, right? Uh, yes, and do it in a way um, that doesn't break the bank. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have this saying at Tracker that sales solves all problems, and <laughs> I think for you know organizations our size that you know, we'd all agree that. Um, you know, if we are selling, um, then things are pretty good, um, and you know, if but if if things are not, then well, you know, we we can be in trouble. And it allows you to grow and to continue work on your product or our next campaign, your next product. So it's definitely something that you know we all seek for as companies, and 
as um, um, product companies, right? Hardware products, obviously to get sales, to get distribution partners, either in the US, either here in Europe. Yeah, that's a great thing. What did it mean for you to go internationally into various markets? It's, it's I must say for us, it's, it's tough. Because you know, as a startup, you always have to choose your battles. You have to choose a terrain. You have to stay focused because the resources are limited. Um, either manpower and, of course, uh, funds and money. So you have to choose where, where you start from. So, for example, we, we decided to start with the U.S. for our first year. Okay. Uh, and now when we got um, things rolling a bit with a few channels over there and sales are picking up, we said, okay, now we're going to come here. This is why we're here at the street to open um, a new market here in Europe. And I'm sure that the next step will be maybe going to Asia. So. Um, you have to choose carefully what you, you, you can't try to do it all as a startup. That's one of the biggest mistakes. Uh, why not? You want it all. <laughs> yeah. well, this is why a lot of companies fail, I'm sure, and, and it's really hard. Every day you need to ask yourself, am I doing the right and most important thing for my startup, for my business? That's the only way to, to succeed. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, the one thing I'll, I'll add is, um, you know, going internationally, you just have to be, um, very calculated on what regulations, um, you know, are uh, very important to, to get what product validation, you know, certifications, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, then also take a, a deep look at the supply chain, um, and then how to, you know, cost effectively deliver um, to those areas, and um, you know, that type of uh, putting in that hard work at the front end, mm -hmm. um, you know, will give you kind of the, the direction and business model of, you know, where do I market the product and how do I market it and, you know, what are my margins? So you can really develop, um, you know, a, a holistic model for making sure that you profitably deliver um, to your customers so that you can support them for the lifetime of, you mm -hmm. know, whatever. Okay. I don't think uh, Ori and Christian said most of it, <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, you have to figure out uh, the logistics and the regulations of each country, so that's uh, that's very important. It means the same thing for you as far as in yeah, your product yeah, and course. going into other yeah. markets. Yeah, we we started you know close to Switzerland, so around <laughs> Europe, not uh, directly overseas. Okay, um, but uh, yeah, it's important to to not go everywhere at the first. Uh, so we're, we're going to switch into another area that I like to talk about because um, I, I know it was a touch point for everyone, was this whole idea of crowdfunding going into retail spaces. Um, there, I think it's more, more so in the U.S. it's being tested within a number of retailers, um, Target, uh, Best Buy, um, Macy's even, mm -hmm. on uh, how do they work with uh, new innovations? And so I know Indiegogo is one of the main spearheaders for um, the crowdfunding going into a retail space. How did anyone do that on the panel? Um, did they work uh, within a retailer through Indiegogo or another crowdfunding platform? And how successful was it? And do you find that it's important? That's all. Yeah. <laughs> a big, large question into one, but... Um, well, yeah, I like that last part of your question is, do you think it's important? And I, uh, my question, you know, would, uh, or w the way that I'm thinking about this is, you know, what's the retailer's brand? And w how do they, you know, what direction are they trying to go in terms of, you know, this whole crowdfunding market represents, um, you know, new products and innovation, um, and how do... You know these retailers see that innovation aligning with their brand, and you know where um, you're seeing this the most is um, it, at Brookstone because they're kind of known for bringing in new innovative products, and um, they um, you know started a connection between you know their retail sourcing group and Indiegogo. Um, the I know the head of hardware at Indiegogo has a call with you know, the Brookstone folks every week and they just go through you know, different campaigns and they're like, okay, here's the ones that are you know, performing, here's their metrics, you know, these are the ones that are most likely to you know, perform. 
So they just tear everything down and, and really take a look at what would be good for the Brookstone ecosystem. And I think, you know, from, um, from a brand perspective, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think that, um, you know, uh, we, we started working with uh, Brookstone um, before this program was really in development. Um, but I think it gives um, startups a really clear path. So you went directly to Brookstone rather than, and, or through a distributor to Brookstone? Uh, yeah, we had already, you know, connect, kind of connected with them. Um, and then uh, this whole program uh, started, um, okay. you know, a few months after we had already gotten Got um, connected and started shipping our tracker Bravo. So, um, you know, we missed it just a, a little <laughs> bit, but it was really helpful to also be able to, you know, tell our, our buyers that, hey, you know, yeah, we did an Indiegogo. And um, I think that, you know, I'm really interested to see, um, you know, what innovation means to a lot of other retail brands. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if that's something that they feel is important to their customers, um, you know, just coming up with a, um, a clear way to really um, start to bring that innovation in. Um, and then also, like Sebastian was talking about, to vet that innovation. Because, um, you know, as a, as a maker and, you know, someone who's, you know, taking people's money, I feel very responsible. Right. And I think that as makers, that's something that, as a community, we all need to be, feel very responsible for. Because if we don't respect that ecosystem mm -hmm. and you know contribute positively to it by right. delivering on our promises and clearly communicating with customers, then it's going to create problems for the future. And you know the the world with crowdfunding looks, I think, a lot better than a world without crowdfunding. Okay. All right. I, th I think all retailers have, have understood that the, um, the products coming out of crowdfunding um, campaigns are real products, products that people love and they want to get them into store. This is why again, Brookstone and I'm sure Best Buy as well are doing collaborations with the crowdfunding campaigns. I, I want to add another thing is um, from a brand um, point of view, when we go and we choose a distributor or a retailer, I think if those two can bring us even half of what the crowdfunding platform gives us as a brand, which is um, feedback from, from users, the, the, um, just to test our product and to do it um, in, in the right pace and, 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 um, um, and with the amount of resources we can give it. That's something that is very valuable to us as brands and as, as, as startup companies. Instead of just going and putting it in 200 stores and then you have no track of your stock and everything goes um, three months later, you, you, you're dealing with with the refurbished units and, and, and stuff. So um, from that point of view, I think it's very important. But I think it would validate for the retailer as well. Um, yeah, when they see that we came from crowdfunding platforms, they know, OK, there's, there's something that people like. I want to have it in stores. Amazon is doing the same as well. I mean, you know, every retailer today, the, one of the first things it does, it go, if your product is on Amazon, it goes, see the reviews, OK, so I'm, I, want, I want it in stores. Right, so Amazon right. Is, is part of the deal as well, the way I see it. Yeah, I think it, it's a win-win situation because uh, the, the distributor or the retailer actually um, already knows that the, the product uh, is something that uh, has been tested on the market, mm -hmm. knows that customers like it. And on the other side, uh, the, the brand uh, has the opportunity to bring uh, his product uh, to an uh, even wider uh, community. You know? mm -hmm. So as far as then, um, if I'm a retailer and crowdfunding, there's a crowdfunding platform that wants to come in, I'm a little worried because um, this is kind of taking my business. Mm -hmm. You know, we get, they get higher margins on if uh, a distributor had come to them directly. Um, so if you're coming in with one product and you know, people can touch and feel and they say they're going to buy it, but now it's buy on command, so direct to consumer. How, what do, what do you say to that? How, I know you have done a lot of work in this area, so what, what does that mean for me, retailer? Why should we do it? Um, why should a retailer have their own crowdfunding platform? Why should crowdfunding, if, um, 
a crowdfunding platform wants to come into a retail space, mm -hmm. why should they do it? They're, they're losing. Yeah. Uh, not, uh, nothing, sorry, nothing beats, right, feeling the product in hand. Mm -hmm. You can see a really cool video on, on our crowdfunding platform, right, that we, we said a lot of stuff. But a lot of customers, they want to feel the product. They want to see it firsthand. Then maybe they will go online and buy it. Right? This is something that retailers have to deal with, I guess. But, but in terms of bringing the product to their stores, I think customers will still and always want to come, see it, touch it, feel it, and then decide if they want to buy it or not. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a really good question. And I think that um, by you know, introducing you know, it as... Um, as a business owner, you have to look at, you know, am I going to introduce a non-cannibalizing stream of revenue like iPhone to iPad, or am I going to have to introduce a cannibalizing stream of revenue like Amazon has done multiple times over and over? And I think that um, it's important to understand when to introduce cannibalizing streams of revenue when it's right for the customer. Mm -hmm. And if you are constantly doing what's right for the customer as a business, you will survive. Mm -hmm. But if you don't do what's right for the customer, then um, we've seen many of those businesses fail over and over. And I think Amazon is the best example of someone, uh, of a company that's introduced um, you know, creative destruction to their revenue streams over and over again, um, but they've been able to survive long term because um, they've created such a great customer experience. And so the question is, you know, um, you know what metrics are, are you measuring at the, the back end? Are you measuring time and store? You know, how much does each parking spot, you know, outside of your store uh, generate when, uh, per hour when someone's there? And can you really start to um, you know, create uh, an audience um, and an and experience within retail stores um, because retail stores have so much power. I mean, the, the power of an employee giving a demo to someone who doesn't understand something and just having that light bulb, that connection, um, you know, between the sales employee and the customer and, and really getting, you know, that person excited is unparalleled. Like, they, I can't do that with videos. Mm -hmm. I, I can't do that personally. There aren't, there aren't thousands of me. Um, but mm -hmm. retailers have that power to create those stories in people's lives. And I think that's where um, you know, retailers can really leverage platforms like crowdfunding to get people excited about innovation and to really start driving the ecosystem um, rather than being in the back seat and you know watching kind of what's happening on Indiegogo before they you know take things to market, they right. can choose to be in the driver's seat and push innovation forward and choose you know what products and concepts get you know shown to their customers. Do you guys believe the same thing? I agree, one hundred percent. Yeah, one hundred percent. I think the key word here is uh, innovation, as Christian was saying. Uh, you know, the the retailer also gets uh, an image of. Uh, of someone who has the latest products uh, of the, that market uh, has, so the customer goes in and feels like uh, he's having the he's receiving the product before anybody else. So that's something as well. Okay, and so from today, you're feeling like uh, people are still wanting to touch products. So is is that important to you? I know you guys didn't go into an Indiegogo store. I'll, I'll mm -hmm. say I'll call it an Indiegogo store. Um, so what would it have meant to you to actually have that opportunity? Well, our, um, our product is also something that needs to be um, explained. It's not something that people uh, are used to see on the market. Um, it has good sides of it and it has also bad sides of it, right? So the education to the consumer is very important. So when I choose a retailer in, or distributor in the US or, or here in Europe, I need I need someone who can also explain and demo my product in store and know how to um, um, tell the story of the product as well as I tell the story of the product. So that's something that is, is key for us when we go and choose a, a partner uh, working within in, in retail. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, does, is that offered um, at this moment within the retailers that you, you work with? Uh, is there someone, are you there? Or you have a team member there? 
yeah, validating so, the product? Yeah, I mean, what, what's been um, successful for us Explain. in the past is, um, you know, like with, um, we launched with Everything Everywhere EE in um, the UK. They're a carrier there. Um, so one thing that we did to make sure everyone, uh, every single employee understood our product was we gave all of them a tracker. And we had at the, their retail conference. And they were all able to install it, put it on their keys, play with it. So that way when customers came into the stores, they just had a very clear idea of, you know, hey, this is how it helps me every day. And, you know, I, I used it to find my keys last week. And that was what helped drive sales. Um, so I think that, you know, for, for our product, um, you know, that's something that we like to do with, with retail partners if we can. Um, and because that really is what drives the, the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, when people, you know, can all have a shared experience and get excited about it, I think that's what makes for makes great products. Mm -hmm. Okay. Arlo, want to add that's, to that's, it? A, that's a great idea. <laughs> we'll use that. Just give everybody a product. <laughs> she gave everyone a product. Everyone has yeah. a product. Um, them, please have it. I think we have time for questions. We're running a bit short on time. Oh, okay. Um, so if I can just uh, step in. Yes. I, I know, uh, Lamar, you've been asking many of the questions, but if I can sort of turn the tables on you. Oh, I just want to get a sense after your conversation with the three gentlemen here. What is the, the big takeaway? Uh, what, what surprised you or what did you learn? I think there's a value for retailers to work with crowdfunding. That's, that's sure. Um, it has a sense of validation um, from the consumer's point of view so that when they're testing a product that potentially could go into that particular retailer, um, they can get validation directly from um, the innovation center that, that is there. Um, there is a sense of competition, I think, a little bit, um, but I, the overall marketing value for them to bring in this innovation that they're testing and that people are getting the opportunity to kind of touch and feel is still there. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important. Crowdfunding is not going away, um, and the things that are being tested in the U.S. will eventually get to Europe. In some way, um, shape, or form, it's going to have way, an impact on our business here in Europe. So I, that's my point of view. So. Lamar, I, I give you the final word. I want to thank you very much for sharing your experiences and your insight with us. Uh, Lamar, Ori, Christian, and Carlos, thank you. Uh, thank again, you. you're with us over the course of the day. So of one-on-one -on -one conversations, social networking opportunities, the conversation will continue off the stage. Thank exactly. you very much. I, I will say anybody who wants to um, get an introduction to the hardware team at Indiegogo, please come talk to me. Um, I know uh, Slava, the CEO, pretty well as well. So um, whatever I can do to help you, if you're a retailer, let me know. In the true spirit of the sharing economy, thank yeah. you very much for sharing your contacts <laughs> with much. us as well. So.